bleeding. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem and hark the herald's angels sing glory to the new The everlasting Lord 
Hello, welcome to the Palm Harvest Network. I'm Pastor Mike Decker. Say hello, Pastor Mike. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Today for our conversation, I invite you to look with me at a portion of the Christmas story. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter two. And so if you have a Bible close by, whether it be in, in paper or in digital form, I encourage you to maybe grab that and turn to Luke chapter two. Here's the big idea for our conversation that I want you to kind of keep before you uh, and even to look for uh, in the, in, throughout the story. And so if you're taking notes in our Palm Harvest app and you want to jot down this big idea, here it is. God actively pursues me, hoping that I will pursue him. So personalize this big idea. God actively pursues me, hoping that I will pursue him. So again, today as we read this Christmas story, I want you to look for this big idea as it plays itself out in the drama. In Luke chapter two, I also want you to notice that there are four things that God does to pursue us. And the first thing, let me give it to you so you can look for it as we start into this story, is that God initiates. Point number one, God initiates. That's the first thing he does in his active pursuit of you and me. So if you have your Bible, Luke chapter two, as always, uh, try to picture the scene in your mind. I'm gonna start reading at verse eight. This is what the Bible writer tells us. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel has said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. You know, here in this Christmas story, the Bible writer showcases how God is actively pursuing us, hoping that you and I will pursue him in return. And the first thing that we see God doing, which I mentioned to you already, in his pursuing is how he initiates. God initiates. You know, the Bible writer paints a picture of some shepherds who are out on the outskirts of the town of Bethlehem doing what shepherds do, which is what? Watching their sheep, right? And we're told here in verse eight that it is nighttime. And so my, in my mind, when I read this story and I try to picture sort of the scene in, in my mind, what I, what I envision, and maybe, maybe you did too, is I, I sort of see the sky as being dark, perhaps with, with stars sort of glittering the nighttime skyline. I don't know if, if you've ever gone camping or backpacking whether it be out in the desert or up in the mountain wilderness somewhere. Um, but if, you've had, if you have, you've likely spent some time gazing at the stars at night, 
Yes? You know, whether you take in, you know, the, the glow at the, of the moon or you try to locate the Big Dipper or the, the, the Milky Way, stargazing is something that you have likely done. You know, for those of you who are living in the great white north in the, or the northern hemisphere of, of, of our area, during the winter, one of the things that you might do, I know I have in the past, is I'll enjoy the northern lights, which are these sort of these mystical colored uh, colors of lights, you know, the gases that, that, that kind of shine in, in the night sky. You know, last month I was, I was on an airplane. I was with a friend. And as we were uh, sitting across one, the aisle from each other, you know, talking about, you know, the, the day's event, we were coming home from a funeral that the two of us had been at together. We were both looking out our window. We beach, were had a window uh, next to us and we were both kind of looking out the window, gazing at the night sky. When all of a sudden Cole exclaimed, wow, he said, did you see that? Uh, a shooting star. I go, no, I looked, you know, quickly looked out, you know, scanning the horizon for, for what he had seen. I said, no, you know, feeling somewhat bummed. And, and I said, well, did you make a wish? Right? That's what you're supposed to do, apparently, when you, when you see a shooting star. I said, did you make a wish? And he laughed and he said, nah. He said, I got so caught up in the beauty uh, of this, this, this shooting star. He said, I, I forgot. I totally forgot. But he said, that was so, so cool. You know, if you've ever done any nighttime stargazing, right? And if you've ever seen a, a shooting star, then you, you can likely identify with, with Cole's excitement. Now, I don't know if, if the shepherds in our Bible story were doing any stargazing on the night of, of Jesus' birth. The Bible doesn't say. But what the Bible writer does tell us is that while the shepherds were out with their sheep, you know, watching them, guarding them at night, so to speak, suddenly and unexpectedly and even alarmingly, we're told that the shepherds' nighttime tranquility was shattered by the presence of one of God's angels. Verse 9 tells us that the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And so in my mind, I, I picture their night sky brilliantly exploding with light. Can you, can you see that? Can you picture that in your own mind? Well, not surprisingly, the Bible writer tells us that the shepherds feel terrified, which is likely how you and I would have felt had we been in their sandals, yes? Which, by the way, on a side note, I think it simply suggests that when we encounter the things of God, that sometimes it can feel scary, even remarkable. And in this angelic encounter, in this nighttime birth announcement interruption, what we see is how God initiates, how God actively pursues us, hoping that we in turn might reciprocate. God initiates. Point number two. A second thing that we can see here God doing in his pursuit activity is how he invites. God invites. Think about this. You know, when the angels announce the birth of Jesus, was it to only the shepherds that the angel was sharing this news? What do you think? What, what does the Bible writer tell us? Look again at verse 10, for those of you who have your Bibles open. The angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to who? To some people? Is that what the angel promised? No, what does he say? He says, I bring you good news that will be, bring great joy to, to all people, right? Jesus' birth and coming is for everyone's benefit, not just the shepherds. Friends, the angels were proclaiming that Jesus came to earth to love and forgive the poor and the rich, right? 
the, the, the uneducated and the educated, the Jew and the Gentile. Jesus came to love and forgive the blue-collar shepherd and the white-collar magi, the married and the single, the sinner and the saint. Jesus came, Jesus was born for all. Jesus was born for you and for me. Jesus was born for everyone. You know, from the beginning of creation, the Bible repeatedly promotes over and over and over and over again this message that God, our Heavenly Father, wants to have a personal relationship with His sons and daughters. So let that, let that truth sink in. God, your Creator, wants to have a personal relationship with you. God, my personal creator, wants to have a relationship with me. Which explains why God is actively pursuing us, hoping that you and I will pursue him too. God invites. Do you know what we call God's invitation? One word, remarkable. Point number three, a third truth that the Bible writer makes really clear here about God's pursuit of you and me is that God directs. God not only initiates, God not only invites, but we see here in verse 12 that God also directs. God directs. Today in Bethlehem, the angel pronounced, the Messiah has been born. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying where? Lying in a manger, right? Notice that the angel's announcement is specific. Notice that God's directions are clear. Jesus was not born, not born in Jerusalem, the city of kings. Jesus was not born in a hotel, maybe where a, a traveling king might bed down for the night or lay his weary head. No, this king, the king of kings, the, the promised Messiah, the son of the Savior of the world, God's Son, this King, he was born where? In Bethlehem, the angel said. And he could be found where? In a manger. Have you ever thought about the fact that God gave these shepherds all the necessary intel that they needed to find and locate his Son? God directs. God directs. I want you to think for a moment about what all was involved in doing the job of a shepherd. You know, I propose that if there was one thing that these shepherds were experts in, it was mangers. Because if you were a shepherd, you knew that a manger was important for the, really the health and the well-being of your, of your livestock. Because manger is really a fancy title for what? Animal trough, right? The shepherds were told that Jesus would, could be found lying in an animal trough. Question, where might one find an animal trough? Well, in most cases, animal troughs are found where? In barns, right? In caves where the, where the animals eat, where the animals drink their water, where the animals even bed down at night. And so I don't think it is a stretch to suggest that these Bethlehem shepherds would have likely known the location of every single barn and every single animal trough 
in that local vicinity. Why? Because it was their job as shepherds to know that information. Now, what I don't know is I don't know how many barns that these shepherds had to, to, to look at over the course of their Bethlehem search. I don't know how many stops that they made as they investigated the night into the night, you know, the exact location where this, this baby Jesus was, was sleeping. The Bible doesn't say. But what I, what I do know and what you can know based upon what the Bible writer tells us here is that as a result of a little bit of sleuthing with the little bit of direction that God's angel had given them, the shepherds found baby, baby Jesus, didn't they? Reinforcing this third point that God directs. Friend, do you ever have moments in your life when you wonder what God's doing? You know, have you ever asked the question, why God? Or why this? Or, or why now? You know, one of the takeaways that, that I personally capture in this Christmas story is the, really the assurance that, that God directs. That God will always give me the necessary information that I need in order for me to navigate my next steps. Now I've learned, and I suspect that you have too, that, that God doesn't always give me the full picture, right? Have you, have, found, have you found that to be true? You know, God doesn't always kind of give me, tell me everything that is gonna happen down the way, but what God often does almost 100% of the time, at least in my experience, is that when I trust him, he will guide me. You know, I love the fact in this Christmas Bible story, I love the fact that Jesus was not born in a hotel. And the reason I love that tidbit is because had Jesus been born inside some kind of hotel room, these shepherds likely would have not been allowed in to see him. I also love the fact that Jesus was not born inside some holy temple surrounded sort of by the religious elite. Again, had that been the case, these shepherds would not have been allowed to enter. Do you know why? It's because if these shepherds were, if Jesus was born in sort of this high and mighty place, these shepherds wouldn't have been allowed because they were in, in that context, they were considered religiously disqualified. You likely know that in, in that day and age, according to the Jewish sort of religious customs of, 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 the, of the faith, that, that the shepherds had the kind of job that didn't allow them to sort of maintain these religious standards. The shepherds had, had a schedule that didn't allow them to, to, to function within the, you know, the strict guidelines of, of the Jewish religious faith. And so consequently, these shepherds were considered unclean. They were considered dirty, if you will, by the religious uppity-ups. And had Jesus been born in a place that had required adherence to these strict religious rules, then we know that these shepherds would never have been allowed to visit him. And yet, and don't miss this, God, our heavenly creator, announced first the message of, and the announcement of the birth of his son Jesus, to who? To a group of shepherds. Demo demonstratively making the point that Jesus came for all. Jesus came for everyone, especially those of us who are outside the church. You know what we call that, right? We call that good news. If you're sitting on the couch next to somebody right now, turn to them and say, amen. That's good news. Here's the real kicker in this remarkable story. Point number four in your notes. And really it's the beauty and the heart of this Bible message. And that is that God waits God waits. God won't force himself on us. He might surprise us. He might do something in our lives that is intended to capture our attention. 
But according to the truth of this, of this story, God the Father won't force us into a personal relationship with his son. Rather, God, help me out, waits. God waits. Just as God did with these shepherds in this Bible story, God gives you and me the free choice whether or not we want to have a relationship with Jesus. God gives you, he gives me the choice to choose his son. And so he waits. God waits. Now, full disclosure, and one of the reasons why I love this story, besides the fact that God announced first his message to a bunch of outcasts, the thing that I really love about this, this story is that these shepherds, they chose Jesus, didn't they? After their encounter with the angels. In fact, the Bible describes, and I suspect these, these, these shepherds were probably pretty amped up when they said, said this. The Bible describes how they say, let's go, right? Let's see this thing that has happened. And what do they find? They find baby Jesus lying in the manger, lying in an animal trough, just as God's angel had promised. And the impact of their personal encounter with Jesus, the impact of their personal choice to choose Jesus is so demonstrative that the Bible writer tells us that everyone who they tell their story to, verse 18, are, are what? What's it say? They're astonished. Or maybe some of your translations say amazed. So here's a question to think about as I begin to wrap this conversation up. Why were these people so astonished at the shepherd's story? Why were people feeling amazed? Do you want to know what I think? I think it's because they probably had this thought like, who'd have thought that the promised Messiah would, would, would be available to a bunch of dirty shepherds? Who'd have thought that the, the coming of the Messiah would have any kind of desire to be in a personal relationship with sinners? You know what we call that? <laughs> Remarkable. Remarkable. Friend, do you want to thrive? Do you want to thrive in a fractured world? Then go to the manger. Go to the manger. Seek out a, a personal relationship with Jesus because he will change your life. Are you hungry to have an encounter with God? Are you hungry for God, your creator, to do something in your life? to work in your world, maybe to change the trajectory of the things around you? If so, where would you like to see God move? If God were to touch a piece of your life right now, where would you like God to touch? You know, maybe for Maybe for you, some of you, it would be, you know, I want God to touch in my work situation, my sort of my career ambitions. I would love God to touch that part of my journey. Or how about a relationship that you're in? Maybe you have a relationship with somebody who you love, or maybe you're in a relationship with somebody who you're not really getting along with all that well right now, and you would say, you know what, Mike, if, if God could touch anything, I would have him touch this part of my life. I would have him touch this person in my life. If you could have God touch one of your relationships, who would you have him touch? You know, I wonder if any of you, perhaps today, can identify with the label that these shepherds carried. I wonder if you can identify with the label of being a religious outcast. 
or of, of, of being someone of someone who is maybe who people consider to be dirty, right? Or damaged goods. Maybe you, when you look at your life and you recognize how people, other people look at your life, maybe your story is marked by hardship or struggle. Aren't you glad that God has a special place in his heart for shepherds? Yeah? Me too. Do you need to hear this message today? Friend, God loves you. God loves me. God has a special place in his life for those of us who maybe aren't perfect, who maybe have a skeleton or two in our closet, who maybe don't have it all together according to the religious elite. God is for you and he loves you. And he, God our Father, is actively pursuing you, hoping that you in turn will pursue him. You know, think about this. The angels in their announcement to the shepherds really said that Jesus was gonna bring two things. You remember what the angel said? The answer is found in verse 10 and verse 14. Look at it if you have your Bible. The angels told these shepherds that Jesus' coming was intended to bring joy, right? Joy for all people and, and peace. Joy and peace. Jesus offers us joy and peace. Are you experiencing joy and peace in your life these days? If not, would you like to experience them? Could you use some joy and peace in your life? You know, based upon the message of this Bible story, this is what I believe to be true. I believe that God, our heavenly creator, our heavenly father is actively pursuing you, perhaps even in this broadcast. God's eyes are on you. And so in faith, I challenge you to invite God to touch your life today. If you would like God's touch upon your life today, or upon the lives of those who really in your world who mean something to you, then I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me. I'll lead it, encourage you to just kind of pray along in your heart with me. And in this prayer, full disclosure, I'm going to ask God to infuse my life, and hopefully you will do the same in your own life. I'm going to ask God to infuse my life and my heart with joy and peace. So if you'd like to have some joy and peace in your heart, pray this prayer with me, okay? So first thing we're gonna do, gonna take a deep breath, kinda exhale, just kinda relax, sit her down, it's been a busy week. Another deep breath. Exhale. Now if you feel comfortable, I encourage you maybe to open the palms of your hands, Symbolically, open your heart, open your mind, and pray this prayer with me silently. You can pray it out loud if you'd like, but you can just pray it silently. Just say this. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for pursuing me. I could use some joy and peace in my life right now. And so as much as I know how, just like these shepherds did many years ago, Jesus, I offer you my heart. Jesus, I offer you my, my mind. Jesus, I offer you me. And so I invite you today in this moment to overwhelm me with your joy and peace. God, I invite you over in this moment through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would overwhelm me with your presence. And I give you permission, Jesus, to begin to shape me and to continue to shape me 
into the person who you want me to be. Because like the shepherds, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Like the shepherds, Jesus, I am not religiously perfect. But from this story, like the shepherds, I choose to believe that you accept and love me, Jesus, that you are for me. So Jesus, today, my prayer is that you will infuse my life with joy and peace. It's in your name that I pray these things. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you for joining me for this conversation. I hope it was life-giving for you. Listen, I would love to, to kind of know what's going on in your life. And so if you have a prayer request or something that you would like me to, to be aware of and to join you on your journey, I encourage you to use our Palm Harvest app to, to you know, that you can download. You can find it at hellopastormike.com. Hellopastormike.com, go to that URL. In fact, you could even use our app, if you'd like to, to donate to this broadcast ministry. If these videos and these presentations are, are beneficial to you or you think that would be beneficial to others, love for you to help us, support us financially uh, in this, this, this broadcast ministry. I'm Pastor Mike Decker saying so long from Costa Mesa, California. God bless you. Happy New Year. And I'll see you soon.
Right, left, right, come on.